So today, actually, my talk will focus on uh, anomaly detection problem. And what I'm going to talk about is that how we develop a kernel-based approach for detecting anomalous structures over a large network. And this is a joint work with my student Xiao Feng Zhou from Syracuse University and uh, with Professor Rings Poor from Princeton University. So here is our outline of the talk. Um, I'm going to start with the uh, problem setup um, and how the problem is motivated uh, from general framework. And then I'm going to introduce the main technique that we're using. It's called MMD and it's developed recently in the machine learning community. And then I'm going to use a simple network example, which is a line network, to talk about our main results and the basic ideas behind it. And after that, I will talk about how to generalize it to other more general networks. And finally, I'll give a concluding remarks and talk about the future work. So uh, first, the problem setup. So let me start with a more general framework of this type of network detection problem. So suppose we have a network that consists a number of the nodes, and these nodes are connected with each other by the edges. So as a simple example, you can think of a sensor network where the, a large number of sensors are deployed in uh, certain geographic areas, for example, let's say in a forest, and uh, the sensors are taking data from the uh, environment. So uh, in general, suppose this node, each node in the network is associated with some data samples. It can be the data samples observed by these nodes. For example, uh, as I just mentioned, the sensors collect the temperature data, for example, from the environment. And then um, we would expect the observations of some of these nodes would reflect a uh, occurrence of a certain angular event. For example, in the sensor network, if there, there is a fire in the forest, then we would expect some sensors receive uh, temp uh, monitor the temperatures. They should see the temperatures much higher than other sensors uh, that uh, are outside of this fire area. So the general goal of such uh, type of framework is to detect whether or not there is uh, existence of a certain angular event. And if there is a, a certain existence, then we'd like, we would like to identify where this uh, angular event actually occurs that corresponds to uh, which nodes actually receive the samples that angular from other samples in the network. And typically, we would expect those nodes that have unusual data will form a certain structure in the network. For example, in the sensor network, we would expect those nodes that detect higher temperature will be very close to each other in a small area. And in more generally, in such a framework, um, those nodes that uh, observe an Euro event may form a certain network structure, for example, a click in the network or a certain path in the network. So such a framework can actually capture uh, quite a lot of applications. For example, uh, if I see a DNA, very long DNA sequence, and some segment may contain some anomalous data, and I want to identify that from the sequence. And the second example is just what I mentioned in the forest. Uh, uh, we want to detect the fire. And the third example is uh, to monitor some anomalous intrusions by the sensors deployed in a security area. And the last one is simply to uh, identify some anomalous structure in a certain geographic area. So uh, such a type of uh, such a type of problem, uh, in particular the framework that I just mentioned, uh, actually have been uh, quite intensively studied by uh, many research communities. 
uh, and they give them uh, they give such a problem different names. For example, uh, in the machine learning and data mining community, they call this as anomaly detection, and statistician tend to call them as detection of certain significance, and the signal processing people would like to call it outlier detection, and they essentially sort of uh, fall into such a uh, general framework. And in general, if we think about how people approach this type of problems, there are two sort of major perspectives. The first one is uh, so more data driven, that's um, most likely be taken by the machine learning and data mining community. So, um, so the, uh, the, the approach is uh, try to uh, <coughs> compare the data or tell the difference between the data samples simply based on the data. And such approach is more likely to be applicable to many data sets because it's uh, simply data driven, and, but um, they tend to be empirical and uh, does not come with a performance guarantee typically. And the second perspective is more uh, model driven and which typically assume there is a certain statistical model underlying this uh, type of framework. For example, the on your data are generated by a certain distribution. And in many cases, Gaussian assumption was made in the studies. And this uh, type of approaches typically come with performance guarantee, and, but it's applicable only to certain limited data sets when the data actually uh, agrees with the assumption in the problem. So what I'm going to talk about today is more, uh, and I think it's uh, sort of more or less missing in the, uh, in the uh, general uh, previous literature, is a combined data and model driven perspective. Um, by this, what I meant is, it's on one side, it's still model driven, meaning that the we still assume the data are governed by a certain underlying distributions. And on the other hand, it's data driven in the sense that there's actually no assumption have been made for the, uh, for the models or the distributions that generate the data, but uh, it's actually the statistical model is sort of hidden, by the, uh, hidden in the data and reflected by the data. And we hope such a combined data and model driven perspective can be applicable to more data sets and also come with performance guarantee. And of course at this point you may think there is a natural approach that what we can do is from the data we can sort of estimate the distribution that generates the uh, data and then based on that distribution we develop certain detection rules. But on the other hand, such approach may not always be preferable. Why? Because the, the ultimate goal here is actually to detect, to do detection. We want to detect whether or not there is an unusual event. And in many cases, such a detection problem could be much easier than actually estimating the distribution. So in which case, you would want to uh, you would want to what you would what you would want to do is actually from the data you want to directly build your uh, detection rule in the so so that you can direct attack the detection problem. So this is actually the approach we are going to take. So let me specify uh, a very simple network and specify what our problem is. And throughout of this talk, I'm going to focus on this simple scenario. And later on, I'm going to talk about how to generalize the idea for this simple network to more general, uh, more complicated networks. So suppose for such a network, a line network, we have n nodes aligned over a line. And uh, each node is associated with a random observation. And we call this random observation as y1 up to yn. And here I want to emphasize each node, in fact, receive only one single sample. Okay. And uh, our problem <coughs> is the following. We want to detect between the following two possibilities. The first hypothesis 
is that all the nodes are generated from, uh, so the, all the samples these nodes observe are generated from one distribution, which we, we, we're going to call it P. And we're going to call this P as typical distribution. And the second possibility is that there exists a certain interval I over the network. And for the nodes inside such interval, they receive samples that generated from a different distribution. I'm going to call it Q. And I'm going to call it anomalous distribution. And this Q is assumed to be different from P. And outside of this interval, the samples are still generated by P. So the second possibility actually is composite, because we allow these intervals to be located anywhere in the network, and the length of the interval can be arbitrary. And for this problem, as I just mentioned, we don't assume we know, so this P and Q are not known. We don't assume any information about it. They're not known, and they can be arbitrary, not necessarily Gaussian or any specific distribution. So this actually requires us to build a non-parametric test, meaning that we don't ex the test should not exploit any information about P and Q. And we actually need the test to be universal in the sense that um, it should be applicable to any arbitrary P and Q. And for now, we make assumption that only Q is different from P. So the performance metric we are going to take is the following <coughs> risk function. So it contains two terms. And the first term is um, if there, there's a uh, H naught meaning there's no occurrence of anomalous event, but we claim there is actually anomalous interval. So that's uh, correspond to the fourth alarm probability of error. And the second term, for a given interval, so if this interval turns out to be anomalous, then we claim there's nothing happened, no anomalous thing occurs. So that's actually the probability of misdetection. And um, we would like to consider the worst case in the sense that we maximize overall possible intervals. Okay, so this is a risk function that we consider. And the asymptotic regime that we consider is as the network size goes to infinity. So if you think about it, as the network size goes to infinity, so the locations of the interval can go to infinity, and the length of location, uh, length of the intervals can take um, actually infinite uh, number of values. So our goal is to design such test so that as the network size goes to infinity, then we want the risk function to converge to zero. And we call such test as consistent test. So if we think about the problem again, so what, what exactly is the problem? So we actually want to dis distinguish between the two possibilities. One, all the samples are from the same distribution. Second, there exists a certain interval that contains samples that, uh, who, who is generated by different distribution from others. So that's the two possibilities. Yeah. What's the difference between M and N? M and N. M and uh, number of observations. Oh, actually, <laughs> so ignore this M. M actually means the, the uh, right. M actually means this max over here, oh. meaning we, we take. So the ob every node receives only a single observation. Oh. So the N is the network size. Yeah. Yeah, so if we think about the problem now, in fact, in fact, the problem at this point, the problem is still not well defined. Why? Because if we allow arbitrary lengths of uh, anomalous intervals, we won't be able to we won't be able to drive this risk function to zero. Why? Because if the length of the interval is too small, then um, we have only that small intervals of only that small number of anomalous samples. That won't give us a good enough um, test. But if the interval length is too large, 
Then outside the interval, we, so we get the samples from P only outside of that interval. With too small number of samples outside of the interval, we won't make uh, accurate detection either. So this simply tell us that we need enough samples both inside the interval and outside the interval to actually tell if there is a difference between these um, distributions that generates these samples. Does that make sense? So next, um, for the problem to be well uh, posed, we, we introduce the following candidate interval set. Okay? So we, this set include all the intervals that, whose length is lower and upper bounded. Of course, uh, for now, I haven't say any conditions on this uh, I mean and I max yet. But we already from the from sort of the high level understanding, we already know that this I mean, the minimal length of the interval, and n minus I max that represents the samples outside of the interval must scale with n. So they must go to infinity so that we make accurate enough uh, decision so that, so, so that we can make the risk function goes to zero. So I will go to solve this problem. Of course, we want to design this non-parametric test that's applicable for arbitrary distributions P and Q. And at the same time, in order to, in order to drive the risk function to zero, we want to characterize how this lower bound, I mean, and how the n minus mx should scale with network size in order for this risk function to converge to zero. Yeah. So the, the consistency is required for each pair of PQ? Yes. You don't know uniformity or any attempt? Yeah, I don't know, uh, but uh, for a given P and Q. So for every, for every given PQ? Yeah. Uh, and is not known in advance uh, L. Can so you say it again? So I think there is here maybe two possibilities. Mm -hmm. So you can, uh, we assume in most cases that L is between, between L mean and L max. It is um, uh, In fact, um, you can take it as assumption, but we're going to characterize yeah, so let's make it as assumption, but later on we are going to characterize the I mean and I max mm -hmm. as the conditions. Okay, but I so, yeah. to ask that there is two possibilities. So, L is uh, in both cases between uh, L mean and L max, but we can ask that, uh, so is, is there a difference in the performance when L is known or not known? So you can get some characterization, I guess. Mm. It's also a problem, right. so it's, it's harder if L is not known. So um, I guess um, let me try to answer and you can tell me if that actually answers your question. Okay. So we have, uh, so now we consider only two possibilities. One is uh, no anomalous. And the second one, if anomalous occurs that I is between I mean and I max. So the third possibility, when I is less than I mean and I is bigger than I max, that's, that's not in the uh, consideration. Is that, is that what you mean? Yeah, so, um, so for that one, we don't consider because uh, eventually we know that for that one, the risk function cannot be guaranteed to converge to zero. So there, there are some previous studies of this uh, type of problem, but they are more, uh, they are all from the uh, parametric perspective. So uh, typically the assumption was the P and Q are Gaussian or P and Q are known at least. And if that's the case, then there are known properties that capture the difference between P and Q so that um, that, that property can be exploited when we build the test. And in particular, when it's Gaussian distribution, and most pa many people assume that uh, P and Q 
P and Q are Gaussian, but with different mean. And in that case, you can sort of exploit the mean difference to build the test. And even if P and Q are not Gaussian, but they are, you, suppose they are arbitrary, but they are uh, known distributions, then we can sort of build the generalized likelihood uh, test to, te to, to detect the uh, anomalous event. So our problem here is mainly uh, the, the main difference from the previous work is uh, it's non-parametric. So there's no knowledge about the two distributions. So they can, dis uh, they, can dif they can be different in the arbitrary way. So the question here is um, mainly how to measure the difference of the distributions from the samples that we receive. Or, or uh, how, how do we, max, how, how do we um, construct the metric to uh, measure the difference of the, how can we tell the difference of the distributions? So uh, the, to answer that question, uh, I'm going to uh, introduce a um, new, yeah. Oh, but for that, you must uh, somehow uh, 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 assume that the uh, error max is, is uh, at least half, half, right? Why? Uh, because, it, you know, if, if the... the, the uh, by one half, you mean one, uh, n over two? N over two, yes. Um, in fact, it's not. But we, we'll get to that point when I talk okay. about the result. Uh, it actually doesn't have to be that small. It can be much bigger. Okay, we, we'll talk about that later. So, um, so next I'm going to get, uh, talk about a uh, performance metric uh, that measures the difference of the two distributions. And it's called MMD <coughs> and recently been uh, introduced in the machine learning community. So uh, MMD represents a maximum mean discrepancy. Uh, why it <coughs> means that will be clear in a few uh, moments. So um, let's start with a very simple question. If we want to, um, sort of compare two distributions, or if we want to characterize the difference between the two distributions, what we can, a natural way to start is to compute the mean. So uh, we can compute the mean of the two distributions to say if they are the same. And if they turns out to be the same, we can go to the second moment. And then if it's the same again, then we go to the higher moments, and so on. So as you can see, so the mean is simply a simple function of x. And the uh, second moment is a function x, x squared, and so on. So in a you know, more general sense, we can actually uh, compute the expected value of an arbitrary function of x. So that's, this, this also measures a difference between the two distributions. So the question is, we would like to maximize, maximally amplify the distribution of the two, uh, maximize the difference of the two distributions. So naturally, what we can do is to take a maximization of this difference over a certain, over a function that's in a certain functional class. Okay, so that, does that make sense? So the class is everything. Yeah. So, so I'm going to talk, it's not everything. So, so, uh, so in fact, um, in fact so, so the question now is, um, so what, what should we uh, take for this functional class such that this maximization is easy to handle? And turns out um, what's called the RKHS is a such functional class. So the RKHS represents the reproducing kernel Hilbert space. So if you're not very familiar with this uh, uh, space, just think about it as a set of functions. And it's uh, typically associated with a kernel function. And um, we, we, we're going to look at this uh, class of functions such, as, such that the function is uh, normalized by one. So it turns out in this particular, in this specific uh, functional class, turns out this maximization is very easy to solve. 
So let me uh, first introduce a little bit what, what, what this uh, RKHS is and how to solve it, this optimization problem. So suppose I have a set of uh, distributions, up P1 up to Pn. And uh, I have a RKHS space that's associated with a kernel. And I'm going to build a map, which is called kernel mean embedding. So this map maps a probability P to an element in this Hilbert space in the following sense. So if I have a probability P, that I'm going to uh, compute an expected value of this kernel function over this P. This kernel function is already, so once I choose this RKHS space, the kernel function is already fixed. So this is a fixed function that for a given P, I'm computing the expected value. So the kernel takes two variables, has two variables, but I take the expected value over one variable, it has one left. So that's, so I'm going to end up with an element in this Hilbert space, okay? So, and this um, element is called the kernel mean embedding of this distribution P into this Hilbert space. You can just think about it as an image of this P in the RKHS. So why, why should this be important? Because it turns out this is the optimization problem that we have. We want to solve this uh, difference, maximize this difference over the function in the Hilbert space. And turns out this optimization can be solved easily. It turns out the optimal value is simply this, um, simply the image of this P in the Hilbert space, that's mu P an image of this Q in the Hilbert space, mu Q, and then the Hilbert space naturally defined a distance between these two elements. Okay, so that's the distance. And turns out such a distance is the optimal value of this optimization problem. So um, in, in another word, um, for any given P and Q, this MMD between P and Q is actually given by the distance between their images in the Hilbert space. And um, it's also due, okay. And it can also be shown that for a certain type of kernels, which is called characteristic kernels, and such, uh, such a mapping, or, or this MMD between P and Q is injective in the sense that it's positive if and only if when P is not equal to Q. And if P is Q, then it's zero. So um, how do we compute this MMD between P and Q? That's a distance between the two elements in the Hilbert space. And it's also due to this particular uh, property in the RKHS, that's a reproducing property, so that this MMD can be computed easily. It can be expressed in these uh, three expected values. And here X and X prime follows P distribution, and Y and Y prime follows a Q distribution. They are simply generic variables. And um, if you think about how we may be able to use this MMD, because we, we don't know P and Q, but we know data. So when we have data, and if this data are generated by P and Q, then we can actually easily estimate this MMD between P and Q from the data by simply insert the empirical mean for each of these terms. Yeah. You see, you're defining the metric so that the kernel estimation works. I'm defining? Defining the metric of performance so that the kernel estimation works. Um, so, um, the performance metric is the risk function. And uh, this kernel is sort of the test that we are building. And in fact, um, so later on I am going to talk about this test work, uh, definitely. So the test works for this performance metric, but uh, that's not the only test that should work. So in fact, you can build other tests um, that also works but may, not, may, may be better or less than the uh, kernel-based test. Okay. 
questions? All right. So up to now, um, we understand this MMT can measure the distance between P and Q, and they can be estimated easily from the samples generated by P and Q. And this is an unbiased estimator. In fact, uh, um, you can also build some biased estimator for this MMD. They work um, better or less in some particular uh, problems. But for this one, we uh, take this unbiased estimator. So next, uh, I'm going to talk about how to use this current, uh, how to use this MMD uh, between P and Q to solve our anomaly detection problem. Okay, so how, how should I build my test based on the MMD? So I want to, again, I want to detect whether or not there exists anomalous interval that contains data generated differently from the data outside. So what I can do is, um, for each interval I, I don't, suppose I don't know if it's anomalous yet. So for each given interval I, what I can compute is this um, empirical MMD between, this, between the samples in the interval and samples outside of the interval. So here I'm going to use this yi, if, so let's look at this term. I'm going to use yi to represent the samples in the interval i and use yi bar to represent the samples outside of the interval. So uh, I'm going to compute the MMD between this yi and the yi bar. So essentially, if I have enough data, what this estimate is simply the distribution generates the data inside the interval and the distribution generates the data outside of the interval. So if, um, if there's no interval that's anomalous, so this MMD I compute should simply, be, should simply estimate MMD between P and P. So in that case, I should get this MMD to be zero for all I. It should, uh, should be close to zero for all I. And if there is a anomalous interval, what I'm estimating here is in fact MMD between Q and P for a specific I. And if I take a maximization over all possible intervals, then I should have one value that's, that's big enough, deviate from zero. So this naturally leads us to this uh, threshold-based test, which is to determine there is an anomalous occurrence if this quantity is bigger than a certain threshold. Otherwise, we're going to say there's no anomalous occurrence. So later on, I'm going to talk about how, how do we uh, build this uh, threshold. So what can we show about such a test? In fact, based on such tests, it's actually not that hard to compute the error probabilities in both cases, the false alarm and uh, the uh, misdetection. And then with a certain manipulations and this uh, concentration inequality, you finally can actually can show that for the MMD-based test, it can be consistent if the minimal length of the anomalous interval is bigger than uh, is is bigger than or equal to this order of log n, and the maximum length. The n minus mx, meaning the number of samples outside of the interval, should be at least at this order of composition of multiple, multiple number of log n. So how, how, how do we understand this? So this simply tells us this scaling can be this scaling can be as slow as possible. But it has to go to infinity, but as slow as possible. And for this test to be consistent, we actually need a threshold to be less than this value. Okay, let's first take this as assumption. Yeah. What is k and t? Oh, okay. So the k is uh, the maximum value of the kernel function, and for the for the Gaussian and Laplace kernel, it's simply one. So it's the upper bound of the kernel Could function. You write what, what Laplace and, and the same kernel is? Uh, let's. So it's, uh, so let's say, 
and there can be a sigma square. So it's uh, it's one. Laplace La Laplace kernel is similar. I don't remember the exact form. It's similar. So not T. Oh, T. T is a threshold. Yes. T is a threshold. So a few <coughs> comments I want to make over here. First of all, as we can clearly see, this n min should be uh, should scale as fast as the order of log n, meaning that the smallest anomalous interval our test can resolve should be at least as large as this. It cannot be smaller than this. And furthermore, the samples left outside should be at least as large as this, but it can be arbitrarily, it can be arbitrarily small, but still can converge to infinity. Yeah. What what is that? The lowercase k. Does it show up? The lowercase k. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, so the lowercase k can, can be arbitrary, but it has to be finite. But does it show up in the convergence of the It's in the Yeah, it, it yeah, it show up there. Well that's gonna depend on P and Q also. Um the, it doesn't depend uh, but it's um depends on P and Q implicitly through this form. So it's, uh, so the threshold must be less than MMD between P and Q. So, um, so if you set T to be, so T has to be less than this, let's say one half. So, so it's. Because it's not universal, right? So if I don't know P and Q, how do I know how to choose T? So I, I'll talk about it in the next slide. So, um, so in fact, uh, if you think about the number of intervals I have in the network, and the, uh, the I mean and the Mx, um, in fact, not that many intervals are excluded from being anomalous, at least from the other sense. So uh, one particular point I want to make is that if we, uh, if we look at this I mean and I max, the conditions on these two, they are actually not symmetric. But if you think about our problem, as I just said, our problem simply want to detect whether, simply want to detect whether or not all samples are from the same distribution, or if there is an interval of samples that's from a different distribution. So it's actually not that important what P is and what Q is, as long as they are uh, different. So sort of from that sense, the uh, conditions um, from the first side, the conditions should, should intuitively should be symmetric because what's inside the interval and what's outside the interval should be symmetric so that I can tell either P or Q accurately enough. But why, why they are not symmetric? In fact, if you think more closely about the problem, uh, it's not that hard to understand because if my anomalous interval is small, as small as I mean, then the number of anomalous intervals I can have over the line network can be very large because I can simply shift it over the line quite many times. Otherwise, so that sort, that sort of increases my probability of making mistakes. But when, when, I'm, when my anomalous interval is large, as large as I max, when it's large, then there are not that many such anomalous intervals in the network anymore. So less likely I'm making a mistake. So this, um, so that's an intuition and this sort of also explains why the condition on I mean is actually stronger than the condition on this I max. So next I'm going to get to the point. Um, since I don't know P and Q, and I should not even know uh, MMD between P and Q. So, okay, so the first corollary simply says, uh, if, it's, if, if by some reason I happen to know the MMD between P and Q, or I s happen to estimate uh, certain, uh, I estimate accurately enough of MMD between P and Q, so I can simply set T to be less than that, so that I get, this, uh, I get these conditions. Otherwise, 
Otherwise, if I don't know MMD between P and Q, what I can do is I set my threshold still converges to zero, but not too fast. So in that sense, as my network converges to infinity, this Tn eventually goes to zero that distinguishes between the two uh, event because I already know that MMD between P and Q should at least be positive. And eventually this Tn will be below that uh, MMD between P and Q. However, I do get certain penalty for that. So if Tn goes to zero, here I'm in the condition of, I mean, if you compare this one and this one. So in the denominator, I get a constant here, but in the denominator, I actually get something converging to zero. That actually tells me that I mean cannot, being the order of log n is not good enough. It has to be strictly, the order of I mean has to be strictly bigger than log n. And similarly, for the n minus i max, I also needed, it needs its order to be strictly bigger than the case, but I know MMD between P and Q. And one further comment. In fact, um, we can, to, to actually obtain this result, we can see that for this one, the test is exponentially consistent in the sense that the risk function converges to zero exponentially fast. But for this one, it's not. Okay. So this sort of finishes our sufficient condition on the uh, I mean and uh, N minus I max, such that the, the test that we build is consistent. So if I uh, summarize it, my I mean has to be bigger than log n. And if I want it to, if I want the MMD based test to be arbitrary, to be consistent universally for arbitrary P and Q, I actually need this, I mean, to scale strictly faster than log n. So this uh, small case omega represents it strictly fast. And n minus I max has to be, has to be in this order. So that's what, do I still have? How much time do I have left? We started at about 45, so, so let's go to 35. Okay, thanks. Um, this is a sufficient condition. So next we are going to wonder um, if there is any other test that works better than MMD. So turns out we can actually show that if we want a test to be universally to, to be universally applicable for any arbitrary P and Q. Then we can actually show that I mean has to scale strictly bigger than log n, and n minus I max has to scale to infinity as n goes to infinity. So if we compare these two, if we compare these two, we can say that in the other sense, MMD based test is actually order level optimal in terms of this I mean. But in terms of I max, this one can grow arbitrarily slowly to infinity. But here we, we have the condition to grow to, com to infinity. So they are, sort of, they're, they're sort of pretty close, but we cannot claim they are equivalent. So in that sense, in terms of I max, we can say that it's uh, nearly order level optimal, but not exactly close. All right. So um, in terms of the numerical result, um, we compare this MMD based test with some other test, um, like the T test, the Smirnoff test. So these two are more like classic uh, statistical tests. Um, and these three are more or less the kernel-based test, using the kernel function to estimate the difference between the distributions. So the, MM, the performance of MMD is represented by these red dots. As we can see, in general, this kernel-based test typically performs better than the, the other statistical test. And among them, MMD test is always competitive. 
So next, I'm going to quickly talk about uh, generalizations to other network. The first one is instead of the line network, now we consider the ring network. Still, the problem setup is almost the same, um, except now the network is a ring. So you can sort of expect what's the difference. In the line network, we have uh, asymmetry in terms of the conditions on I min and I max. But now, they are actually the, the same, sort of symmetric. Why? Because even if my length is I max, then the number of anomalous intervals is still the same because I can actually turn it around. Okay. And uh, again, we can sh actually show that I mean is uh, is order level optimal, but I max is um, not. So the next uh, example is a two. Suppose we have a two-dimensional lattice, and uh, the anomalous uh, structure is defined to be this anomalous disk. And um, still, the problem is pretty similar. We want to detect whether or not there exists such disk. As you can see, um, so the result is um, pretty much similar to what we characterize, but here there's uh, one important difference. So we require n squared minus d max to be bigger than this. But if you think about this uh, problem structure, even the biggest disk, okay, even the biggest disk in this lattice network still left some samples outside. And turns out that number of samples outside is already good enough to satisfy this condition already. So that says this condition does not need to be there. And um, of course, we can uh, show that uh, on the converse side, we can show that uh, this d min is, uh, this order for the d min is necessary, and that claims the MMD based test is actually all order level optimal here. Yeah, I'm finishing. And the final one is the, in the lattice, we want to detect a certain um, rectangle over there. And the problem is uh, pretty similar to what we had before, except, um, uh, again, a difference on the uh, S max. Because if you, if you are not spent, if the anomalous structure not span over the entire network, then you left the one dimension out. And that sample is good enough for uh, for for uh, for the uh, for telling the distribution of p. And uh, of course, we can show the necessary condition and show that MMD-based test is actually order level optimal. So finally, um, so um, let me conclude quickly. So we actually uh, use the kernel-based MMD as a metric to build the uh, anomaly detection te uh, test, and we can actually show that we, we can show the sufficient and necessary condition um, on the network structure such that such a test is um, consistent, and we can also show that MMD-based test is uh, in many times is order level optimal or nearly optimal. And this is a work that we uh, submitted to a journal already. It's online. Finally, uh, in terms of the future work, um, if I go back to the initial framework that I mentioned, so what I talk about is just the one specific problem in the in such a framework. Because, uh, for example, we require the uh, number of samples at each node is only one. And uh, as a further generalization, um, in many cases, each node can receive a, a lot of samples uh, in the data stream. And we, what we can consider over such a network, we can consider the point event, meaning that the anomalous interval may not have the structure or may have certain structure. And the asymptotic regime that we can consider can be a large network and also the large number, uh, large sample size or trade-off between these two. So this finishes my talk. Thank you.